uh, I'm so excited for this evening and I'm so uh, happy that all of you could join us. Um, good evening and welcome. My name is Kevin McGarry. I'm the Associate Director for Public Engagement here at the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. I'd like to begin our program this evening by offering some helpful Zoom webinar tips, as I know that uh, some of us are very used to using Zoom and some of us maybe don't use it as often. Uh, our presentation this evening will be closed captioned with subtitles for the convenience of our audience members who are hearing impaired. You can locate those controls to turn on or turn off the subtitles in the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom screen. It is a CC icon for closed captioning that you can click on to get a drop down menu with options. If you do not see the CC icon, click on the more icon or the three dots and you should see the option there. This panel presentation will be recorded and will be made available at a later date on the both on the trust website and our YouTube channel. Um, during the uh, during the presentations, the panel uh, we have three panelists who are going to be presenting this evening, and, um, and we have slides and, and a, a lot to cover. Um, you, while while the presentations are happening, uh, you can actually ask questions using the Zoom chat function or by submitting the questions using the Q&A function. Both of these tabs are located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. After our three presentations are completed, all our panelists will come together to answer some of your questions. Unfortunately, um, we will not be able to get to all, all the questions most likely, but we will do our best to address as many as possible. I'd like to thank you uh, for joining us this evening for this very special community discussion on Cesar Chavez Day. Um, about a, a really a, a, a pillar of our community and a very important historic building. Um, the, the title we've, been, we've titled uh, this evening's panel presentation, La Casa de la Raza, the history and legacy of Santa Barbara's first Latinx city landmark. Before we begin, we would like to take the time to acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our region. Let's take a moment to honor these ancestral grounds that which, uh, on which we are collectively gathered and support the resilience and the strength that all indigenous communities uh, have shown worldwide. We, are, we tonight and here in, Santa Bar in the Santa Barbara area are on the traditional territory of the Chumash peoples. Now it's my honor and privilege to introduce our moderator, our MC for the evening, Mr. Mark Alvarado. Mark is the founder of the One Community Bridge Project and currently serves as the Director of Intervention at San Marcos High School, my alma mater, Go Royals, by the way. On top of being a very talented professional musician, Mark has dedicated his life to the field of community and human development. He has served in a variety of leadership positions and has, has really spent his life trying to bridge, uh, bridge people and communities together. Mark is going to introduce our panelists um, and, and he's also going to ask you, uh, our audience members, to kick things off before we start our first presentation, a couple of questions. Um, so, Mark, welcome, and thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Okay. Well, good afternoon, or good evening, as it, as it is. Um, as Kevin said, my name is Mark Alvarado, and I do have a deep connection with La Casa de la Raza. Um, my parents were founding members. I was in that building at the age of six, all the way up into adulthood. Um, my dad owned a furniture store on State Street and he donated some of the early office furniture there uh, to, the, uh, to the building. Um, one of the first uh, questions, I guess, that we're gonna put out there to folks is, you know, the word uh, Raza is used in, uh, in the name of, of the building and it always has different interpretations. So we're going to ask you to put into the chat what your interpretation of the word rasa means to you. So you have a multiple choice there to, to put it in. And so um, go ahead. And I think we can go ahead and get started on that as, as, as a kind of a fun icebreaker or kickoff in, for the event. Uh, and I'll just add, Mark, you can choose more than one answer. So this is okay. a, okay. a checkbox thing, if you'd like. Am I going to do the second question, Kevin, or are we going to wait to maybe midway through? That's up to you, either way. Yeah, I think we can go a little bit, but when we take a little break, maybe, perhaps. Okay, sounds good. We have about 87% have uh, done the poll, so we'll just give it another second here. Uh, 
All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end the poll and show everyone the results, and uh, you'll be able to see it. Everyone should be able to see it. Can you see those results, Mark? Right. Yeah, I see. Do you want me to talk a little bit about them? I, I, I think we should. Okay, very good. So 64% um, um, selected uh, Latino and or Chicano, Chicana community, 40% all races, all people, 16% the cosmic people, and 9% weren't sure. Um, obviously, because of the presence of the, of the Mexican-American community in, in Santa Barbara, and, and, and the word La Casa de la Raza being in Spanish that a lot of folks um, really relate to the term being directly related to Latinos and, uh, and Chicanos or Mexicanos. However, it's my understanding and talking to some of the elders and founders that the word Raza was really uh, meant to, to include all people of, of all backgrounds. And so uh, that's the one that I, that I gravitate towards too personally, but once again, it's up to interpretation. Gosmica is in there. Cosmic is in there um, for for uh, you know very interesting reasons because there's there's a lot of different influences that have come through um, the Southwest that have come through this whole experience that we have had with our indigenous background and with the different European influences into who we are today and and it's very very dynamic and cosmic and so those are are my remarks on the uh, on the interpretation. Folks are welcome to put stuff in the chat. Um, before I go on, Kevin, I did send you something in the direct message, so please look at that and respond to me. Okay, so, so why are we here this evening? And what's the purpose of being in this space this evening? Well, 601 East Montecito, Montecito Street has been the home of La Casa de la Raza for 50 years. It's Santa Barbara's historic cultural hub for activism, cultural celebrations, family gatherings, music concerts, and social services. It's rich with these memories and is so deserving to be designated as a historic landmark in Santa Barbara, which it is. Tonight, we're going to listen to our panelists of speakers associated with some era of the history of La Casa de la Raza. And they're gonna talk about, and within their, their role, within the organization, La Casa de la Raza, the 501c3. Within their expertise, they're gonna talk a lot about the historic designation, community history, and the services for those most in need. And so I wanna let folks know that we have here with us, Nicole Hernandez from the city of Santa Barbara, architectural historian, Marisol Ortiz, is the former director of Family Resource Center at La Casa de la Raza and the internationally known artist Manuel Unzueta, who is a founding member of founding member of La Casa de la Raza. So with that said, I'd like to segue into our first panelist, Nicole Hernandez. Nicole is the city of Santa Barbara's architectural historian. She worked as an architectural historian for five years at the historic Denver Incorporated and four years for the city of New Orleans before coming to join the city of Santa Barbara in 2012. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Nicole. Hi, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. Um, I would just like to give a quick note from my last name, Hernandez. Um, I married into the Latinx community um, many years ago. I'm very honored to do so. Um, but I also want to talk about what a city architectural historian is. Um, it, it, it was one of the biggest honors of my career as an architectural historian to designate this beautiful piece of architecture and learn about what a nurturing place this has been to the Latinx community. As an architectural historian, my main job is to protect places that are designated historic and designate them to be such, to remain as testaments of architecture, artistry, and history of our community. 
um, when we designate a building, it is the city um, saying that this building is worthy of preserving and can't be torn down and altered on the outside. So it can always express this history. Next slide. Um, this was the main slide that we had um, up when we designated the building on November 10th, 2020 at City Council. So I just want to go over quickly what is actually a landmark. Um, they are officially designated by the City Council as worthy of historic preservation as the most important buildings in our community. We have a lower tier of historic buildings for less, um, more like individual houses, but these are really important does um, usually have history and architecture associated with them. They um, are protected from demolition and we do have 135 landmarks in Santa Barbara. Next slide. So um, we have in Santa Barbara some really great overreaching laws that protect our historic culture. And one of them even comes from our charter that um, has the City Landmarks Commission, um, has the power and duty to recommend landmarks to City Council. And then we have it further outlined in our municipal code um, with the authority to adopt um, city landmarks. And that actually outlines the criteria to be a historic landmark. And I'm gonna go through the criteria that this building does, um, qualified for. Next slide. Um, yeah, you can't just be old. You have to have a lot of other criteria to be a historic landmark. So we're gonna go through those one by one for this building. And we also have a general plan that um, calls out for our, our community to identify, document, and designate individual historic resources. Next slide. So now I'm gonna get really into, now that we know what the landmarks are, um, some of the history and um, qualifications for this building. So um, this building, as you see it today, was constructed in 1931, especially in the main corner. It's the Spanish colonial revival style, and the history that it's associated with it is that it's been home of Casa de Rosa since 1970. Next slide. So um, it was actually, um, here's just a quick map if anybody doesn't know where it is on the corner of North Calle Cesar Chavez and East Montecito Streets. Next slide. Um, I just wanted to, we go, we always start back from the first history we can find of what was on the site. So it actually, part of it was originally um, constructed in 1917. Um, first, it was a contractor supply warehouse. And then next slide, we always look for old newspaper articles to find out what was there. We also look at old maps and here you can see um, the site without the big corner tower um, in a 19, um, in an early Sanborn map. And then in 1931, we find the map that shows the big, beautiful, um, octagon corner that is such a icon for this community. Next slide. And that this was the final building permit for that beautiful octagon tower. We're always um, trying to trace exactly when a building was constructed and who was part of that um, when we designate a building because we're going to talk about what those elements were. Next slide. So this building actually qualified for five of the criteria outlined in our municipal code to be historic. Um, it really does retain almost all its original integrity from that 1931 when the octagon was built, allowing it to convey that appearance. And that's one of the biggest criteria. It has to still look the same. It has had to stand the test of time. It also, as I said, um, represents the unique heritage of Santa Barbara as the center of community for the Latinx people in Santa Barbara. And in 1970, the property owner, Warren Coleman, had an empty building and um, he sold it for the 27,000 square foot building for $14,000 to the Chicano positive movement, which later became Casa de la Raza in 1970. And this it really shows and found in the record that even the Planning Commission in 1973 approved this cultural center providing less than minimum parking because it's such a unique situation 
and um, it's in the public interest and community need. And they, Cole? Um, yes. Yeah, it, um, the interpreter is asking us just to slow down just a little bit. Oh, okay, sure. So when the um, city council passed the, um, or the planning commission passed the, um, the community center, they identified it to include 4,000 square foot dance hall, a library, a reading room, a lounge, and small theater and office units. So this building emerged from the Chicano movement from the late 1960s and late 1970s and early 1970s. It involved many different organizations and political perspectives, including the United Farm Workers, the Brown Berets, the Crusade for Justice, La Raza Unida, and many others. In Santa Barbara, the community member activists had pushed for social change as the city's Mexican-American residents were spatially segregated for decades based on racial discrimination and housing on the east side. These residents um, had organized for multiple generations, but it wasn't until 1971 when the new unique community-based social organization known as La Casa de la Raza established inside this building that includes its well-known iconic tower. Just, it's only blocks away from Our Lady of Guadalupe Catholic Church in the Milpas Corridor. And it became a critical stopping point for Chicago movement leaders, just like our, the co-founder Cesar Chavez, who we're honoring today, who often met with the community members in Santa Barbara around union boycotts and organization drives. Later, Teatro de Esperanza, the Theater of Hope, was based out of Casa de la Raza, and large murals were created and assigned by Manuel and Zueta, who you will have the honor to hear from next. Um, next slide. So moving a little forward from the 60s and 70s, La Casa de la Raza evolved into this full-fledged community service center. And here you can see a picture of um, the boxing, the children's boxing team, as well as it was a host to many um, theater concerts. And here's an old 1984 Red Hot Chili Peppers concert um, advertisement. It also was the home to English language classes, computer classes, job training classes, educational workshops, classes for youth, weddings, quinceañeras, fundraisers, and fest fundraisers and festivals. Um, next slide. And here, I think on the next slide, you'll see just a sampling of other festivals and programs that held at La Casa and Dora Rasa. It sits on the walls when you go in there and it even includes, I love, um, it includes even Poncho Sanchez, the Latin jazz player. Next slide. Not only, um, well known, not only for the programs, but the building is significant for its architecture, as I mentioned earlier, um, just, how important Spanish colonial revival's architecture is to Santa Barbara. After the earthquake of 1925, much of the rebuilding in Santa Barbara was in this style. The building reflects the um, envisioned um, theme of Santa Barbara that the early planners wanted to move the whole city to be in. So we had a unique city. And this included the industrial area of East Montecito, only a few blocks, blocks away, the Santa Barbara Junior High School, the commercial corridor of Milpas, all being designed in this style as well. It was infiltrating all parts of Santa Barbara, not just the elite on State Street and the high end homes, but for people of all means, including small homes for moderate families and apartment buildings, bungalow courts, and as you know, this industrial building. Next slide. I like to um, always put a few little of the minor details that some people don't see when they just see the big picture. Um, I love that the building has this beautiful weather vane on top of this central tower with these um, little circle um, vents made out of terracotta tiles. And it also has, between the bays of the wings, it has these um, stylized drain spouts that are very, um, telling of the Art Deco era that was also going on in the 1930s. Next slide. So the building actually qualifies for being identified with um, Manuel Nzueta. Um, he's in, and you'll hear from him, but I'm just gonna tell you why. 
I, we found it so important that he was one of the criteria that the building qualified as a landmark. He's internationally known muralist. He also painted a series, he painted the series of murals in Casa de la Raza. Um, and he was also in the 1970s. He's, he's the artist in the United States who reclaimed the Mexican mural tradition by covering urban barrio walls with didactic messages celebrating Mesoamerican culture and by presenting this work as an alternative to Eurocentric aesthetic sensibilities. He, the godfather of this art in Santa Barbara is Manuel Zueta, whose creations climb the walls all over the American Riviera at schools, colleges, Casa de la Raza, the Franklin Center, and other locations. He's produced some of the most powerful statements and images found in Chicano art since inception in the height of the Chicano movement. He has an ability to define and recognize the historic and cultural relevancy of the Mexican American experience through his paintings and murals has made him a local treasure. He, and he's an international recognized artist as well with work displayed in Mexico City and the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC. His exemplary, he has also had an exemplary commitment to education and community service and has been a beacon of hope and inspiration for thousands of students through his lectures um, at public schools at Santa Barbara City College and UCSB, including countless volunteer hours he's given to support the community. So you will have a treat to hear him talk about his own murals soon. And one, one more slide. So we also, when we designate a landmark, we um, talk about um, how the details of a building are um, important. And here you can, as you look back, you really do see that the whole building sort of um, comes together with its symmetry around the octagon and the terracotta tiles on top over contrasting with like the smooth stucco walls and just minor details that really make it an elegant piece of architecture. And it also qualifies because it is a unique and physical characteristic representing something familiar to our community. Um, and it has also become just a welcome place in Santa Barbara with this tower bring, welcoming all the community around to come in and find a place. The next slide. What has been so lovely for me um, when we did come to the final designation is the beautiful testimonials that so many people from the community came out and told about this, how this place is important to them. We had over 11 letters of support and 10 speakers in support and the city council unanimously told, um, designated the building. Um, what is so important also about historic preservation is it tells stories in such a compelling way. This story of the Latinx people that we've heard tonight will not be obscured or overlooked. It tells the truth about Santa Barbara and how we can elevate, protect, and interpret and activate historic places. It is a way to explore the truth about who we are collectively, a way to demonstrate our respect for each other, our strengths, achievements, and legacies. It's a beautiful octagon tower and precious murals will now be part of Santa Barbara's story forever. That is all in my presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nicole. Once again, that was excellent. Hey, Kevin, I'm wondering if we can get the next um, um, poll question up on the screen to share with folks. I think it might be a good segue uh, after um, Nicole's presentation. Can we do that? I, everyone should be able to see it now. Poll number two, can you see that? No, I don't see it yet, not on my screen. There it is, okay. So, what meaningful experience do you think of when you think of La Casa de la Raza? And that's especially for those folks that grew up in La Casa like myself. Um, all of these um, um, choices resonate um, with a lot of us who grew up since kids in that building. But um, for other folks who might not have had that experience, what would you have liked to have enjoyed um, in that building? So Kevin, you, can you can select more than one. So I'll give a little okay. time for this one. Um, again, it's not a one, a single answer. Okay. A lot of these things or all of them <laughs> are experiences you've had. You can select. I can all remember them. like the concert, the concerts. Um, you know, you talked about Red Hot Chili Peppers. I remember Los Lobos, BB King, um, 
God, reggae concerts. It's just a lot. I've, I've performed in there many times. Um, and one little tidbit that I'd like to share with folks that they might not know is that one of the reasons why Delaware Plaza is so successful during fiestas is because of that torta booth that La Casa de la Raza has always had there. Well, it wasn't always there. We were always at La Casa during fiesta and it became a huge celebration. And the city kind of came to La Casa and said, you know what, why don't you come to Delaware Plaza and bring your party over here? And so a lot of folks don't know that the original tortas were born out of La Casa, out of a celebration that, that we would have in the neighborhood that eventually moved downtown. I love that. And it's the second time I heard that story. And now, now I won't forget it. So here's, um, here, I'm <laughs> going to end the poll. I think about, seven, it's about 80% have participated. So let's see the results. Yeah. So I'll just go over these real quick. So um, community and cultural events, 95%. That's awesome. Youth and family services, 55%. Concerts, 53%. Weddings, 37%. Quinceañeras, 37%. Activism and community organizing events, 58%. Immigration services, 37%. And uh, educational programming, 42%. So as you can see, you know, it, it, it just runs the gamut and it's just really demonstrates how valuable of a resource um, the, uh, the, the La Casa de la Raza building has been to our community. So with that said, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our next uh, panelist, Manuel Unsueta. Uh, Manuel Sueta, as, as, as Nicole described, his, his artwork is, is, is an internationally known artist. And he is a founding member of La Casa de la Raza back in the day when we first opened up in 1971. And it's his Chicano theme murals that adorn the walls of the La Casa building. And if you haven't had a chance to go in there and get to see the work, you need to see these masterpieces because that's really the jewel of all of what we're talking about in a lot of different ways, the interpretations. Manuel is a retired educator teacher from Santa Barbara City College, but he also was a student advisor for EOPS where he assisted me many years ago. Um, Manuel has also taught at UCSB and other institutions, colleges and universities throughout the Central Coast. As, as Nicole stated, his artwork is featured in the Smithsonian Institute as well as in museums in France and Mexico. And so without any more from me, I'd like to turn it over to my, um, my mentor, my friend. Um, he's like my big brother. Um, he's, he's helped me immensely throughout my career professionally. And I'm just honored that we're in this space together one more time to, to, to do this, to do this for, for the public. And so Manuel, why don't you go ahead and, and, and let the folks uh, hear your story with, about La Casa de la Raza. We need your microphone, Manuel. No, you're muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you turn up the volume somehow? Um, he's on AirPods, so. <laughs> can you hear him? I can hear him, but it would be better. Can you disengage the AirPods and just put them through the audio on the on the computer? The thing is, my computer, the speakers are busted, so he wouldn't be able to hear you guys very okay, well. Okay, well, then we're going to have to do the best we can. Okay. Yeah. We can we can hear you. Okay. So, Manuel, uh, just speak up so we can all hear and uh, speak clearly so the translator can. Uh... Okay. Thank very you good. very much. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Listen, uh, I just want to thank all of you for all this. And already Nicole said a lot of stuff about me at La Casa and Mark. All I want to let you know is a little bit or much more of that, the history of La Casa de la Raza that I learned since I first joined in 71. Therefore, I want to let you know that uh, I am a product of history. My grandfather on my mother's side, he came to Santa Barbara in 1920. And can you believe it? He said, uh, when he crossed the border in El Paso, Texas, he said, I am visiting uh, an uncle in Santa Barbara, California, and he's very old. 
So if his uncle was very old in 1920, that means that that uncle of his must have been born way back in the times of the Civil War. Eventually, my uncle lived here in Santa Barbara in, uh, in Laguna Street. And when they, there was an earthquake in 1925, my grandfather and all of them, they said, okay, there's no more jobs in Santa Barbara, so you got to get back to Mexico. Is the time when they repatriated Mexican people because of the, of the uh, situation with the economy. Eventually, our family goes way back to 1920. My father came here in 56 and the whole family in 66. Therefore, I am very much into history. I am very much into doing research about our people, not just my family. And that's how I ended up being involved with a lot of things about history. Therefore, if I may, uh, when I was going to Santa Barbara High School, I was involved in doing drawings and different things. So, you know, they made me feel like an artist. And uh, eventually they gave me a one-man show when I graduated in 68, first one-man show that they gave. And eventually that led me to other things. Uh, in 1969, when we had an oil spill, uh, my mother wakes me up and says, Mijo, turn the TV on, there's an oil spill. And that's how, how we started. You know that no oil situation here in Santa Barbara that started the environmental movement indirectly and directly to this country. My father was working cleaning the beach and I took my, ske uh, my sketchbook and I made some drawings of what was going on. Eventually I did some very powerful drawings that they put in the Museum of Art, a dying fish and a dying seagull. And then eventually they gave me a scholarship to go to Europe and, and get to see a lot of stuff over there. Then later on I got another scholarship in 71 to go to Mexico and see the murals of Mexico, Jose Clemente Orozco, de, uh, Diego Rivera and Siqueiros, and I was totally impressed. I get back to Santa Barbara, and in order for me to be able to get to the university, thanks to my cousin Joe Herrera, who was my mentor, and he grew up here, he says, Menu, you gotta go to UCSB. And the only way that I could get to UCSB is if I joined the soccer team, which I did. And eventually I declared my major in 1971 art. Therefore, what I am trying to tell you is that I'm at UC Santa Barbara in 1971 and, and, the, and in April and May, and I was taking a class, dummies that don't know anything about math. <laughs> and one of the guys in that room was Leo Martinez, one of the founding fathers of La Casa de la Raza. And he tells me, hey, I understand that you like murals. I say, yeah, I just did one at Santa, Barbara, uh, at Santa Barbara City College. And he says, hey, listen, we just opened this place in Santa Barbara and we want you to come by. So I went and uh, I noticed that they had a lot of walls. And I said, well, you know, maybe we can do something in the fall. So in the fall, they invited me to start a mural in, in a place in there that you know, was totally destroyed. Remember, La Casa was a place that, that they used to sell construction work. There was dust all over the place. It, it was impossible to move around La Casa, but there was a lot of spirit around the Chicano movement, which invited us to get ahead, to go to college, you know, not to be afraid. And I was in the middle of that stuff. So I came to Santa Barbara, uh, after, you know, being on my first uh, uh, semester and quarter at UCSB. And then in November of 1971, I started painting a mural that we used to call the library. And that mural, actually, I, I cannot believe it, that people said, hey, we like murals. And we had a big event that Tomas Castello and other people Leo Martinez organized and people came from Hope Ranch and Montecito and they liked what they saw and I couldn't believe it. When we uncovered the mural, man, they start making donations. So I'm gonna give you the perspective of an artist, but at the same time, my observation of what happened at La Casa historically. So after I finished my mural in 1972, Leo and, and other guys at La Casa, old timers that I will always remember that they are gone. 
They say, Manuel, why don't you paint another one? So in the hall of La Casa de la Raza in the lobby, there was a door, so they cover it. And I painted the uh, Chicano family dedicated to my family, my father, my mother, and, and to all the families in the Chicano movement. Why the Chicano movement? Is that it gave us energy. We felt that we had a reason to do different things. We were not afraid to talk about politics, about culture. And as long as we had the constitution of the United States under our hand, we could do just about anything. Therefore, I started coming to La Casa de la Raza while I was a student at UC Santa Barbara. And when the students got divided over there in 1972, many of them started coming to La Casa de la Raza, like Ruben Ray, I'm talking about, uh, oh my God, so many guys. Uh, uh, I don't want to insult anybody. Uh, Sireño Rodriguez, people that came from different parts of California, and they started joining La Casa but with a heavy philosophical, political idea, okay? A lot of them were more interested in politics and, and planning and that. Well, La Casa de la Raza, according to Leo and, and Tomas Castello and uh, other people, they said, no, no, La Casa is gonna be a center for culture. Therefore, we had this challenge in 72 about the connection between politics from UCSD, Santa Barbara City College, in what people from Santa Barbara wanted about La Casa, okay? Therefore, what happens is that as we begin to organize things to make La Casa good, I volunteered to start working on different things, especially fixing La Casa with art and, and making it look nice. While in another side, we had both doing different things for social activities and other stuff were very involved in politics. So by 1972, it was obvious that La Casa was a presence. In 1972, La Casa was a presence in Santa Barbara. And looking at the size of the building, all of a sudden we realized La Casa was the biggest Chicano center in the United States. I had gone to San Diego. My God, they were so small. And I went to Sacramento. So at La Casa, we had something going, but the place was totally destroyed. So in 1973, uh, with all those helping us, old timers and people that helped and founding fathers that even they put their houses in risk to buy the place, we started uh, beautifying La Casa. And my idea was that La Casa could not be a viable center if we cannot get it together by make it look attractive. That was my contribution. I already had done two murals and I already had done a lot of work, okay? I was a volunteer. I was finishing my master's degree at UC Santa Barbara and many other people that, like I said again, I don't wanna mention names because I don't wanna insult those that I might not remember. So by 1973, we were doing uh, La Fiesta de la Comunidad, the Fiesta de la Community, to, contradict the city of Santa Barbara, where they call it old Spanish days. And sometimes they discriminated about Mexican ideas. And we started to do different things. Like uh, there was a, a, um, a strike against the uh, garbage collectors and we helped them. And we also helped a lot of people from Mexico that were coming into Santa Barbara. But then all of a sudden in 73, 74, we get <laughs> this, a uh, uh, suggestion that we should open a, a clinic at La Casa de la Raza. And I said, oh my God, a clinic? Yeah, because you know, we can help the community, but also Guadalupe up north in Santa Maria and Lombok, they also wanted a clinic. And oh my God, we started to do different things and fundraisers because we needed to fundraisers for you know all these things, okay? Eventually, we opened different things for Lompoc and Santa Maria. Between 73 and 76, we had Cesar Chavez coming in. My murals, four murals were inaugurated in 74. We had Jane Fonda and we had her, her husband to come to La Casa to give honors to all of us, okay? And that was way back up until 77. But when we realized that things were changing in 76, we started bringing Mexican bands, famous Mexican bands of music 
so that they could attract the Mexican community as well. We brought the best bands of Mexico, Los Freddy's, you know, Los Solitarios, and eventually in the 70s, Los Lobos, and Malo, and, and Tierra. Eventually, everything kept on going, but still politics was part of it. And when I became president of the board in 76, I made it very clear, we gotta live, we gotta live behind the political, uh, personal issues and let us turn La Casa into a power, a powerhouse of culture. So between 76, when I was president, we brought the best poems of Latin America. We brought uh, famous people, including the governor, uh, Mr. Brown and, and the mayor of LA, Mr. Bradley. So La Casa was really doing good stuff. So the idea was to keep it as a cultural place where we can put politics aside, where we can move on, we can go beyond Santa Barbara and go all the way into the records of the United States. Therefore, uh, I finished uh, my, my term as president in 79 when I started teaching uh, Mexico abroad through Santa Barbara City College and UCSB, but I still kept on coming and if you don't mind, the idea was that we had a commitment to La Casa. I never would say anything wrong about La Casa. I was called by the news press to say things about La Casa. I never gave a comment to the press or to TV about anything that might be going wrong with La Casa de la Raza. La Casa de la Raza, de la Raza belongs to no one and to everyone. We are the only center that belongs to the community. Therefore, we realized that things are getting expensive. And by the 1980s and 90s, La Casa begins to owe a lot of money in property taxes, which I did not understand why, because we used to pay our taxes on time, all through the 80s. And through the help of many people, La Casa kept on being open. Uh, some old timers began to pass away, like George Solina, it's like Mr. Torres, like, uh, I, I cannot believe it, okay? That a lot of the old timers began to pass away as La Casa begins to have economic problems. But at that time, we depended on the Mexican American community up until the 80s, people that spoke English and people that liked the music that we brought to La Casa and, and different things. But then all of a sudden, things began to change. Santa Barbara begins to have a big, a big, uh, phenomena with people from Mexico arriving to Santa Barbara and they wanted Mexican services. They wanted things in Spanish. They wanted things that reflected their culture, but they were not politically active because a big percentage, percentage of them, they were not citizens. So the Mexican community couldn't vote for change in Santa Barbara and the Mexican American community was becoming very conservative in the 90s, and they refused to do different things. So by 1990, 95, La Casa became a place whomever wanted to come, either to have services, to have culture, and we have a Mexican-American situation where they wanted things in English, and then we had a Mexican uh, phenomenon at that time that they wanted things in Spanish. So when it came to elections, in 98 to 2005, we couldn't get the Mexican community to become citizens. Manuel. I'm talking about, yes. Let me, let me, so, just, the, let me just put you pause yeah. you there right there because we need for you to, brother, I know you could go on talking about this history for another 30 minutes, but we are limited to time. So I just wanted to ask you, okay, how much? give me a couple more minutes just to kind of wrap up your thoughts. But I, I okay. love the fact that you did the segue from the 80s into the 90s serving the immigrant community now and so if you could wrap it up, wrap us up so we can move on brother I, i'd appreciate it okay thank you so by 1990 we realized la casa was in problem economically uh some of the directors did not follow things closely and some people got upset about that so we have a mexican community that doesn't vote they are not aware of a lot of things in the city. And then we have Mexican-American people with their kids that are becoming conservative in a way. But in the process, if I may, La Casa by 2000, 2005, 
was a house that needed help. So we had Mr. Tomas Castello, who helped La Casa to survive very hard times. And then we had people that volunteered and people that worked at La Casa to make sure that La Casa kept on going. So by 2006, 2009, La Casa was hurting financially. And myself, starting a family, I could only give so much time like many other people, not that they needed me or anything. All I knew is that my cycle with La Casa was beginning to come to an end as a volunteer. But the issue is I care about La Casa. La Casa represents still the uh, 2000s. La Casa still is gonna keep on being alive if all of us can put our differences aside and we can say, listen, this place doesn't belong to anybody and it belongs to everybody. But the issue is that we gotta pay some bills, but no matter what we do, we need the help of the city, the state and the country to make this place survive. So I wanna let you know that this place will always be in my heart. And I gave this place 30 years of my life as a volunteer. And uh, I wanted to make sure that it sticks around and it becomes a historical place. Gracias, Manuel. Thank you so, so much. Okay, let's go ahead and get into our, our final panelists of the evening. Then we have some time for some questions. And I, I think we might have one more poll. I'm not sure. But anyhow, I want to enter. Mark, we do, we do have one more poll. I, I want to wake everyone up right before Q&A. So we're going to save it. For, okay, for very good. Time. Very good. Um, so at this point of the, of the discussion, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Marisol Ortiz. Uh, Marisol is the former director of the Family Resource Center at La Casa de la Raza. She is a Santa Barbara native and has 19 years of experience working with the local community with access to services and helping the underserved people fight for justice on, a day, on their daily lives. And she gave, out of those 19 years, she gave 13 years um, to La Casa de la Raza. And I think it's, it's, it's a good, another good segue that Manuel mentioned, you know, how things shifted to address the needs of the Spanish speaking immigrant community. And I can tell you this folks from firsthand knowledge and experience and witnessing that Marisol was on the forefront of that work. And she continues to still do the outreach and, and help folks that just have her cell number and they still call her. So Marisol, go ahead. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the introduction. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the Chumash people who are the traditional custodians of this land. Um, I, would, I would also like to uh, pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, as well as any other indigenous people present. Um, I would also like to acknowledge uh, all of the founders. Um, I first started with La Casa and, and you know, I like the way that um, that Manuel, uh, you know, talked about how he transitioned from the 80s to the 90s. Um, I first started uh, hanging out with, at La Casa uh, in the 90s. Uh, I was a machista uh, when one of the local high schools. And so um, uh, Benny uh, Torres uh, used to bring a lot of the youth into La Casa. And so uh, we would, you know, go and have conversations. And this was during the hunger strikes at UCSB and the boycott of the of the UVAS, and we were trying to get, um, you know, we were really trying to get uh, ethnic studies into our high schools even back then in, in the early 90s. So um, thank you for that. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, La Casa de la Raza, uh, the organization celebrated 50 years of community service. Um, la Casa de la Raza was created by its collective founders. Uh, in 1971, giving birth to our legacy as grassroots organization dedicated to supporting and preserving the Latinx heritage, culture, and community engagement, and giving access to programming and resources that support community uh, and, uh, and, and really empowered uh, empowerment and education. And so, um, you know, we're really excited to to have that and, um, and really be a part of that as an organization. And again, I'm talking about the 13 years 
that I've experienced there working in the Family Resource Center. So next slide, please. Um, I would also like to acknowledge um, Cesar Chavez's birthday today. Uh, today is his birthday and it's also a federal holiday. Um, and so many places were uh, really named after Cesar Chavez. And so uh, La Casa de la Raza is also the Cesar Chavez Center, uh, known for the Cesar Chavez Center. And this includes also the street uh, that uh, is adjacent to the Montecito Street is also uh, Calle Cesar Chavez. So I just wanted to acknowledge him today as well. Next slide, please. And I'm, I'm gonna try really not to, um, you know, I know Manuel and Nicole uh, really mentioned a lot of great uh, things in, in our history. And so I'm gonna try not to really overlap it too much, but born out of the Chicano movement, uh, you know, a lot of these walkouts uh, a lot of these organi organizing walkouts with the farm workers in the 60s, uh, Mexican American students walked out. And this was so like historic for you know a lot of our uh, parents and abuelitos, all the stories that that we hear um, that really uh, brought together so many people, um, thousands and thousands of people uh, during this movement uh, in East Los Angeles, and so. Uh, about a year later, 1970, uh, La Casa de la Raza was founded by students, workers, educators, businesses, people, community activists, and more, and, and quickly became a cultural hub of, organ, uh, of organized collective self-advocacy. And it really provided vital services and fostered community expression in the community. Um, it was the home of the people. And so this was something that was really neat uh, to, to see that people, uh, like Manuel Unsueta that come and express, uh, you know, their art and whatnot. So amazing, amazing. Next slide, please. And I just, I really wanted to uh, bring together this uh, amazing photo. Uh, La Casa House's first community health clinic, as Manuel had mentioned earlier, which, which was amazing. Um, and so what's really cool about that is that even uh, as we would uh, host some of our staff meetings or um, see some, some of our uh, family members, uh, there was still a, a lot of the pieces from um, that community health clinic, like a little sink you know, in an area. And so there was still people that would walk in and uh, talk about their uh, experiences there in, at the clinic. And that was always amazing to hear uh, from community. Um, uh, also, it was best known for its venue, for the Chicano Theater. And so this was really cool um, because uh, the Chicano Theater was a theater for social change. And so El Teatro La Esperanza was, was amazing. Uh, you know, we had live bands, big concerts, art shows. Um, and some of the live bands that, uh, that were like legendary were, uh, you know, um, Los Tigres del Norte which is really cool. Um, next uh, slide, please. Uh, so the Family Resource Center uh, was really uh, something that was really born from the, La Clinica. So they, you know, we expanded services, uh, or the organization expanded services. And so really uh, Monday through Friday, uh, you know, uh, the Family Resource Center was open nine to five at no cost and uh, helped walk in uh, families uh, with appointments, uh, helped with access to government, social and educational services, community resources and referrals, individual case management. Uh, a lot of the, the, our hardest cases were actually referrals with uh, social services. Uh, they really passed along, passed along a lot of the um, amazing, uh, heavy uh, cases that uh, nobody really knew how to navigate. But La Casa de la Raza with the history and our connections, right, with our sister agencies, uh, we were really able uh, to help and navigate uh, with help with our, with our familias. Uh, we helped with the tenant rights, workers' rights, um, immigration services, and housing information, community service it was a, it still is a community service site. 
uh, consumer protection services, assistant with translating documents and help uh, with writing official letters, trainings, individual uh, achievement opportunities. That was something that was huge. And so, um, you know, the Family Resource Center was, was really uh, a space that was uh, open and many of the people and volunteers uh, that came through really uh, said and uh, referred to it as the heartbeat of La Casa. Next slide, please. And so some of the, uh, some of the things that we really uh, help with uh, in our community and brought together uh, was really a behavioral wellness support groups, right? And so uh, we really helped to reduce the mental health stigmas and make, uh, make a space safe for community to learn perspective factors and stress management and life skills. And so uh, some of the amazing support groups that came together weekly were Un Cafecito Entre Amigos, El Arte de Amarte, Yoga and, med and, and Meditation, uh, Sabaditos Saludables, and Platicas de Bienestar. The Platicas de Bienestar was really a, a, a lifeline for a lot of a lot of our uh, families that uh, that didn't have an, uh, an outlet and they were isolated. And so this became a virtual uh, space where uh, people would learn and, and, uh, and express a lot of the concerns uh, and family engagement strategies, uh, strategies and resources. Um, next slide, please. The youth programs, uh, just want to really show you guys a few of the pictures that uh, that really stand out. Uh, youth programs were uh, amazing. We have some pictures of, of Olin, uh, the Fit Noche de Ciencias that were at La Casa. And so uh, that, that poster there was really nice to look at uh, from, from the youth programs, but the youth programs were often a really amazing space and uh, was really nice to hear uh, the laughter of the children, uh, especially in the summer, when a lot of families uh, needed affordable programming. So La Casa de la Raza definitely offered that. Next slide, please. Here are some more pictures of the youth uh, and their contributions with La Casa. Uh, there's a picture of some of the youth uh, carrying uh, the sink for uh, the, our world famous torta booth. Um, and uh, some of the youth that are beautifying La Casa. Next slide, please. And uh, during the, the Thomas fire, uh, you know, it was a, a, a massive wildfire that devastated Santa Barbara County. I mean, it was one of the largest wildfires in the history of our time. Um, the immigrant workers were hit the hardest. And uh, during that time, uh, we really uh, were able to uh, create a winter break uh, programming for our families. And uh, this was really made possible by a lot of our volunteers, uh, our local teachers, artists, um, UCSB students, uh, you know, they all really helped make it possible. So this is a, a really nice uh, picture of, of Circulo uh, during those times. Next slide, please. And again, this is a, some more uh, pictures of our winter programming during that time. Uh, we were open from eight to five. Um, you know, so this was really when uh, the school dis district was forced to close. And so this was really a place where families were able to bring their children absolutely for free at no cost. And we provided them with a, a uh, a warm lunch and a snack, uh, which is really great. Next slide, please. And uh, shortly after uh, the Thomas fire uh, really devastated our community, um, you know, it was something that, you know, was just uh, horrific. And so uh, La Casa, you know, was a hub for that direct relief. And so we partnered with the 805 and Docu Fund, 93108 Fund, Hope California, Unity Shop, Hospice, Listos, 
and so many more agencies. And, uh, you know, our Family Resource Center team provided case management for hundreds of cases and families directed, uh, you know, directly affected by the mudslide. Uh, one family had seven intakes having lost three immediate family members and many neighbors and friends in the debris flow, as well as their home and all of their possessions. And La Casa was known for its expertise in helping resolve very complex cases again and making a huge difference uh, with families served. And uh, here's a, a little slide here of the freeway being shut down. And mind you, a lot of our familias, uh, you know, uh, really, you know, had to trans, uh, had a hard time because I guess they got stuck here. And so um, transportation was a huge issue. Um, and so a lot of our, uh, a lot of our cases were, uh, you know, intense uh, because of a lot of the families were separated. And so uh, this was amazing, amazing to see everybody working together. Um, I mean, I still remember when the 805 and DocuFund, uh, we just grabbed, you know, computers and we just lined them all up uh, at a safe distance and we were able to really help people, um, you know, with the intakes with that. And that was just uh, an amazing to see how community really came together during those times. Uh, next slide, please. And, uh, you know, even after, you know, years of trying to work through all of the disasters prior, uh, the pandemic hit, right? And so, you know, immigrant workers, again, were hit the hardest and they were, you know, affected because of their work. You know, a lot of them worked in the food industry, um, hospitality, many Latinos, uh, you know, couldn't do Zoom. And, uh, you know, they were hit the hardest uh, by unemployment. And so uh, in March uh, 2020, uh, La Casa La Raza, uh, because of the world pandemic, faced a lot of challenges and uncertainties uh, where, you know, many families, multifamilies uh, didn't know how to isolate or how, where they were gonna go and isolate. Uh, food access was a, a, a really big, you know, um, question. Uh, you know, the fear of public charge, people were afraid to even go to the food bank, uh, you know, shortages of masks, um, really the importance of social distancing and uh, sanitizing was, uh, was just a big deal. But also the technological boundaries with our elders and, um, and a lot of our Latinos that were monolingual Spanish speaking, uh, you know, had a hard time with their children, uh, either not having access to the internet. And so this was just, uh, you know, exceptional, just hardship for, for everybody. And so these are just a few of the pictures of us doing a, a, a small parade for isolated elders. Um, and then we also helped, uh, and, and again, thank you to all the volunteers, but we helped all, uh, you know, feed Three to four hundred people weekly. And these are families, um, uh, with the help of the World Central Kitchen and Rincon Brewery. They they made and they created these amazing uh, prepared meals where uh, they were delivered to La Casa, and then we and then uh, were able to uh, deliver out to the families that needed it. Uh, next slide, please. So cultural arts, uh, cultural arts really provided the Greater Santa Barbara with historical commemorations and cultural celebrations. And so this was a positive sense of community for all. Um, you know, our center uh, with having, a, you know, having these amazing dancers uh, really come and practice weekly uh, was amazing. Um, you know, and so having, you know, uh, our celebrations there and having, uh, you know, our posadas uh, was just something that, you know, we really wanted to keep with our, with our community so that the, you know, younger generations would be exposed to, uh, to such beautiful um, cultural arts. Marisol, Marisol. Yes. yes. 
Yeah, so we're gonna need to have you kind of wrap it up as, as quick as you can, because we do want to get to some questions and 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 add a few more comments when, when you get a chance. Okay, okay. Thank you, Mark. And so I just want to just, uh, I'm going to wrap it up, but uh, there's just some more pictures of our Dia de los Muertos celebrations, our Posadas, uh, Mercado Tonantzin, and uh, some of the uh, parades that we were invited to. That's one of the solstice parades. Um, and uh, next slide, please. I just want to just quickly touch on La Casa's inspiration to have its own uh, LP uh, low power uh, FM station. The future KZAA LP96.5 came from one of its board members, Elizabeth Robinson. Uh, due to her work with KCSB, um, a local college station, she saw the potential and value for local, regional, and national conversations. And so you can tune in and listen to American Indian Airwaves, Que Madre, Food Hacks, and Que Pasa Con La Raza. And I'm sorry, folks, but because of the time, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce our board president. Um, Lisa uh, Valencia Sherrod is La Casa La Raza's board president. Uh, and she will bring us up to present uh, day as we look uh, ahead to the future of this legacy. Yes. Lisa, are you there, Lisa? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can see you and we can hear you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Lisa Valencia Sherritt, and I am the board president of La Casa de la Raza. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just finishing another historic meeting, actually, about Casa de la Raza right now. Um, so really glad to be here. Um, I just wanted to give the current update that the, and also to really help bring clarity to there's kind of confusion right now, uh, La Casa de la Raza, because we know, you know, that it is this magnificent building and it has such a rich legacy as a nonprofit. Um, but right now there is a distinction between the two, the nonprofit Casa de la Raza is in a current cease of operations until a bankruptcy case is settled. So unfortunately, we don't know when this will be over, but we assure you the heart of La Casa de la Raza is here for the community and we're gonna keep going and we're gonna come back uh, to serve. And so we just, we want people to know that the La Casa de la Raza, the legacy that you've just heard all about and talked about, um, it, it's, it's alive and we will be coming back. So this photo right here is from a photography class, Cochile Wali, um, in 2006. And this was a program that we have at La Casa. And this is my motivation, um, what keeps me going for La Casa as a board president to come back and to have this youth photography and bring other youth programs and family resource center and everything back. So uh, thank you so much. Um, I am available. Uh, for questions in the future. I know there's a lot of questions in the community about the current um, situation. So just so grateful. Thank you to the Trust for Historic Preservation and everyone, all the panelists and just all the supporters that La Casa de la Raza has had for the last 50 years. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lisa. So before we um, get into the next poll question, I do, there were a couple comments that came in and I want to do recognize um, um, Salvador uh, Garena, who um, made mention of the educational services that um, UCSB students brought to La Casa de la Raza dating back to the 70s. Um, there were 30 to 40 elementary school students during the, the school year and up to 100 during the summers with lunches provided by Community Action Commission, now Community Fi. Um, and that was a huge project. I, I know I benefited from that when I was a kid. So thank you, Sal, for, for reminding us. There's such a rich history that you can't always get everything in, in such a short period of time. And I also want to recognize Michael Montenegro for also um, remembering that, you know, La Casa was responsible for the organized the largest rally that in March that Santa Barbara has ever seen back in uh, 2006. So thank you, Michael, so much for making us aware of that history as well. Um, Kevin, do you have that other poll question we can put up real quick? I definitely do, um, and this is uh, this is more of a were you paying attention 
uh, question okay. to our audience members. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna launch the poll here, and you should see it on your screen shortly. Uh, let's see. Okay, so the octagon, or we know it as the tower, that is now the symbol of La Casa, uh, was an uh, original architectural fixture since 1917, and and the, and was, you know, part of the original construction of the building. Is this true or false? All right, we have about 65%. Just wait another few seconds here so everyone can participate. While we're waiting, if you do have any specific questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. There is a feature, there is a feature within the chat that allows you to go into the QA section uh, within this Zoom meeting. All right, I'm going to end the poll and uh, share the results here, Mark. Okay. Okay, well, 35% said it was true and 65% said it was false. And most people were correct. It's false. It wasn't until the 1930s that the octagon tower was added as an architectural feature. Uh, it wasn't a part of the original construction. And did Nicole state that during her presentation piece? I wonder if, who was <laughs> maybe, maybe if she didn't, if she didn't, it was in her notes that I looked over. So yes, okay. I did. <laughs> okay, so, so kudos, <laughs> yes. kudos to those who got it right for paying extra extra special attention to Nicole, who by the way is overseas. Where are you, Nicole? Again, please tell us where you're at. Uh, Portugal. He's in Portugal. Beautiful. Okay. Um, well, I think we're, we want to wrap it up, but we do want to get to some questions. If we have any specific questions, um, I'm trying to see, Kevin, do you see any questions, Kevin, that could be answered? Um, I, there is a good question about, um, does the historic landmark designation protect uh, the La Casa building and site from being sold to developers in the future? I think this is a, a quite good question for Nicole. Um, and, you know, the worry is that it would become more apartments or condos. Um, what is the, and, and I know you went over this a little bit in your presentation, Nicole, but maybe you could reiterate what the designation actually means for the building. Um, yeah, so the designation will protect the exterior for demolition, but it does not protect it from transferring ownership or use. So you, you've probably seen buildings like in Los Angeles that used to be factories that are now condos. So people, somebody could buy it and make it a different use, but it would still have the same exterior. They would not be allowed to demolish it. So we can't protect the use. So I'd like to invite all of the panelists back up to the screen so that uh, Mark can, um, so we can have everyone for this, this uh, Q and A session. Okay. Um, Maybe for Lisa, there's a general question here. How many members are on the organizational board now? And can you tell us who they are? Oops. Did you hear the question, Lisa? I did. Thank you. Um, OK, the board of Casa de Vasa, there are four members currently. They are Ana Rosa Centino. Peter Leva, Ismael Huerta, and myself, Lisa okay. Valencia Sherritt. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so um, I'm trying to see if there are any other questions. I think I can, I can uh, there's another question from uh, Monica, uh, uh, attendee that might, uh, this is Kevin, by the way, the, the voice behind, <laughs> behind the tech here. Um, I think there might be a, a good way of asking this that people can, um, all, maybe all the panelists can answer. What What do you think about, what is it about the building, uh, not just uh, every, all the services and all of the experiences that uh, since 1970, what do you think it is also about the building that 
that has made it so important and such an integral part of, of the Santa Barbara community and especially the Latino and Chicano and, um, and, and these communities. Um, do you think there's something about the building that stands out beyond it, just it's the things that Nicole talked about with the designation for maybe for each of you, what, what, what about the building speaks to you? Okay, I'll go, I'll go first and then I'll, I'll do a round robin. How's that? Does that sound fair? Yeah, so, you know, for myself personally, I, I, I think, you know, what it really represents is really the, the blood, sweat and tears of marginalized people in Santa Barbara. I think, the, I think that, the, that the vibe, the energy, when you go into that building, all of that lives there in that building to this day um, with the celebrations, with the music, um, the services, everything that all the energy, all the love that people brought into that building, either seeking services or giving services or volunteering or whatever it was, it's a place that has this original feeling of love that is Santa Barbara, is the old school Santa Barbara love that we all know, those of us who grew up in there, and that was the place. So that's what I think is important about the building. Nicole? Um, yes, I think um, when we talk about the building itself, I think I pointed out some of uh, like physical features that are just so beautiful. I mean, the symmetry of the tower, the octagon, the beautiful details, the windows, they all tell the story of the people inside and are really intricately done. And it's really quite a remarkable feature on um, that corner. It really anchors the corner and you can also see it when you're like driving on the highway you can like right when you pass it you look over and you see that huge octagon when you're going up north and I think those physical features tell the story that's the why we keep them they'll be held in those walls Mr. Ensueta do you want to tell us what's so special about the building please uh, make a note about this all of you La Casa de la Raza was the only standing building in that uh, four corner section. Before 1972, there was nothing in there. So when they decided to start building across the street, they were gonna build different uh, buildings, different from us. And we argued that all the buildings around this area, they should look like La Casa de la Raza. Please take this in mind. All the places around La Casa, the three corners, they designed them so that they could go along with La Casa de la Raza, something that we insisted on way back in the 1970s, okay? And remember, they were going to build ugly buildings like uh, Mission Linen Supply, or they were going to, like, at the end of the Gerrit Street, ugly buildings. Hey, Manuel, Manuel, not, sorry to interrupt. Our interpreter can't hear you. Can you come closer? Can you get closer to the computer? Uh, okay, but can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, now we can. Okay, Thank you. So, okay. So what's the question again? No, you were just talking about the buildings. Just finish thanks up with that. To yeah. la, thanks to La Casa de la Raza, the buildings around that area, they are attractive because we fought way back in 1978-79 that the first building across the street, which now is a big business, that they should build it in the style of Spanish Mexican style, like La Casa de la Raza. Then, if you notice the apartments, too, you know, the uh, close to the north side of La Casa, we argue that those apartments should also reflect La Casa de la Raza. That's an argument that I will always keep with me. Otherwise, they would have built really ugly buildings, just flat buildings. And I hope you understand that, okay? Because if you go to Mission Lane and Supply and then you go to Gutierrez Street and then you go to the next street, they're really ugly buildings. But because of our fighting way back in, in the late 70s, early 80s, we were able to win with the mayor of the city, the people that were gonna buy those buildings that they had to keep up with La Casa. And the reason was they wanted to keep in peace with us because they felt are we safe? Are we safe? Is La Casa dangerous? <laughs> I said, no, no, you give us respect and you don't have to worry about anything. 
and I, I will keep always in my mind. That's why La Casa is a special place that you can find in any building in Toledo, Spain, in Guanajuato, Mexico, is a building that you can find anywhere. And here in Santa Barbara, we have it. And I think that we have to do something. Thank you. Thank you. Marisol, we, we, we're running out of time here. So oh. just make, let's yes, make... I'll be quick. I'll be quick. Uh, La Casa La Raza, to me, the building screams history. It screams this really, you know, um, culture. It screams culture from like, my tios and my tias and my dad, you know, just saying, hey, you know, I used to go to Los Bailes there. And so uh, that to me is really super important. Also, uh, a story that I, I like to always express and mention is that, you know, we had somebody come in and, you know, I was sitting working on my desk, typing something away. And she just kind of walks by and she goes, you know, if it wasn't for this place, I wouldn't be here. And, you know, I, I got up and I walked over to her and I said, really? I said, why is that? And she's like, because my parents met here. You know, this is where they met. And so if it wasn't for this place, I wouldn't be here. And so that to me just always stood out. You know, when I see the pictures of, of my tia and her wedding, I know exactly where it is. It's in the main hall because of the background of Manuel's uh, amazing murals. Um, but to me, La Casa La Raza speaks a one-stop shop. You know, thank you to, you know, cause that used to be there, um, AA Primer Paso, BC Centro, the ILRC, um, the Immigration Legal Resource Center, uh, you know, uh, Techno Cafe, you know, helping people navigate through technology. That's what La Casa means to me. It's really this evolving, you know, place for uh, you know, all people to come. Thank you so much. And Lisa, we're gonna give you the, the last word on this as we wrap it up. So what, is, what does the building mean to you? The building means to our ancestors, their gifts to us and our gifts to the future and really just determining being persistent until we make our dreams in our personal lives and as a community. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, hey Kevin, I think um, we're we're um, gonna go ahead and wrap it up here. We want to thank everybody that stuck with us for the hour and a half of this very very special event. I can tell you that all the questions that didn't get answered, we do have your emails, and we will do our best to get responses back to you in a timely manner. Um, other than that, I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank the Trust for Historic Preservation their staff, their leadership, um, but especially those community members that joined us this, this evening uh, to make this a special event. It is recorded and I'm hoping that it'll be available for the public to review at, uh, soon enough. So Kevin, I'm gonna give it back to you. Yeah, no, I'd like to thank all our panelists so much for, for sharing your, just your personal experiences and your, and your stories around this really magnificent building and part of the community. And on behalf of the trust, we're really grateful for your time and, and um, we're just very happy to be able to host an event like this uh, to bring our community together and talk about, you know, an important place that really um, matters to a lot of people. Um, we, I, I will say that, uh, like Mark just mentioned, we do uh, record, we do, we're recording this, so there will be a, a recording on our website. If you just go to sethp.org um, slash lectures, which is where we put all of our Zoom lectures, it'll probably take about a week because we, um, we have to upload and then edit um, the video um, and, and get it up uh, on there and it'll also be on our YouTube channel, um, which is the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation's YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, just want to reiterate Mark's gratitude and say thank you to all our panelists. Thanks for being here and thanks for everything you've done for Santa Barbara. Thank you. And everyone, everyone in the audience, have a great night. <laughs>